Good morning and happy Saturday. I'm Caroline Sandoval, Education and Outreach Manager at the Hayward Area Historical Society. We here at Haas would like to thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have filmmaker Mimi Shakarova and film producer Aisha Knowles with us. They are here to talk about the making of their documentary, The Apology, which discusses Russell City and the formal apology by the city of Hayward in recognition of the impact of the forced removal of Russell City residents. If you have questions throughout the program, feel free to type them in the question and answer section that's located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will make sure to have time for Q&A at the end of the session. Without further delay, here is Mimi Shakarova and Aisha Knowles. It's such a beautiful day and you could be spending it doing a million other things. So we appreciate your time and spending this hour with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, you know, we thought, Aisha and I thought that the best way to um, talk about the film is more of a conversation uh, between the two of us. It would be, I think it would be a lot more engaging than you coming and listening to a, a presentation. So we, we thought that, you know, we can throw some questions back and forth and you can learn about our process and the making of the apology through um, our conversation. So Aisha, I'm gonna start by asking you, well, I'm gonna say the following. It is because of you that this film exists because this was entirely <laughs> your idea because before you reached out in like two years ago in 2021, I had never heard of Russell City. So I'll just start with this and you can take it from here. <laughs> and And you know, I, I uh, thank you first, Mimi, but that's uh, that's a big statement uh, that that I won't take credit for. Um, but I, you know, for the for the purpose of the webinar, I'll I'll, I'll roll with it. Um, but I think there is no one else who could have put the apology, who could have created the the apology. Uh, except for you. So thank you. So I'm sure people are wondering how the apology even came to be and, and how we met, um, which is kind of a funny story. Um, so uh, maybe I'll I'll start, right? Because I know that was one of the, probably one of the questions. Uh, so you, uh, I actually met you when you were working on uh, a, a different film called In the Red uh, during my time at the Alameda County Fire Department. And uh, there was a request to uh, shoot some footage at one of the firehouses in San Leandro. And, uh, and I didn't really have a lot of information about the, the, about whatever needed to be done at the firehouse in San Leandro. Um, which is not uncommon um, at that time. I no longer work for the Alameda County Fire Department. Let me just say that. Uh, so the uh, I didn't have a lot of information at that time. I was the the public information officer for, and I had uh, the jurist. I had a, a lot of different jurisdictions, so I was always into something. Always had something going on. Um, so when the, the call came in, I was very short with you, <laughs> uh, is what I will say. Um, That's an understatement. Yes, understatement, yes. Um, so what, go, you go ahead. <laughs> and so, then I called Wellington, a, a firefighter at the time in the, in the county fire department because he gave you my contact information. And I said, what is this, what is this request about? What is the, why didn't you tell me the information for the request first? Um, why are you giving out my contact information uh, to someone else without relaying the information to me first? Um, and obviously you, you made this commitment without asking me. So that's, that's part of the backstory. Well, and also he gave you, he gave me your cell phone number. So I was just calling and I didn't know it was your cell phone right. number. And so right. when I called you, uh, you were very short with me. And I have to also say that the reason I love the fact that we have this now 
is that I think even if I came to you and I had an Academy Award, none of it would have mattered because I had to earn, I had to earn yeah. your respect. I had to earn your trust. And it took a long time yeah. to get to a place where you were cool with me, where you just yeah. felt like, okay, this woman is, she's legitimate. She's <laughs> not, you know, she's the real deal. And I think even during the making of In the Red, we were not there yet. I think maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe when we showed it at the Grand Lake Theater, we had 600 people there, you know, everyone was there. Maybe that's when you realize, okay, this is, you know, and you got to see it because you hadn't seen the film. No, correct. Yes. So, yeah. So we go way back. We go back 10 years. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. so when you reached out, I thought, I, I, I was under the impression that Russell City was somewhere in Southern California because I felt that I knew the Bay Area fairly well. I moved here when I was 17. Uh -huh. So I've lived here for a long time and I read a lot and I thought I would have heard about this place. So I remember my initial reaction was, you know, we were working on another, another project. It was a short film project and we were in the middle of it. And I remember thinking, I don't have time to drive to Southern California. And then I remember your reaction was like, Southern California, this is like 20 minutes from your house. This is in Hayward. And I said, in Hayward, how is this even possible? And then I don't know if you remember, but your dad was, he was not available for a while. You know, he was going through some stuff. And so it took a while to set up that initial interview. Remember? Yes, yes. And yes. your dad, James Knowles, Mr. James Knowles was the first interview we did in 2021, long before the apology resolution was passed by the city of Hayward. Yes. Um, so we had already started working on the film months and months before uh, the apology was passed. Yeah. And um, do you wanna do you wanna tell the good people about that first interview? Well, well the the first interview was uh, was actually something I didn't give my dad a lot of details about ahead of time. Uh, because he would have killed me. Um, so my sister and I, and I actually didn't give my sister information about it until, I mean, they thought it was going to be a traditional interview where you were going to come and interview my dad. They didn't know that we, you know, my sister and I were going to ask my dad questions and that you were going to film us interviewing my dad um, as more of a family you know, a family style conversation and, and kind of telling the narrative about Russell City, um, which I thought was a, a wonderful, you know, approach to us as a family learning something about Russell City, because growing up, we didn't really hear outside of the Russell City reunion picnics, we didn't really hear many stories about Russell City, unless we were around family members who were talking about Russell City. And that, you know, that was, that didn't really happen. Um, and so it, I approached it the way I would work, you know, like an emergency and you just give people information, you know, it, it's presenting information to firefighters at, at a, an emergency scene. It's, you know, giving them the facts and then explaining process. Um, and so th there's little time to negotiate. And so with you there, you know, he's not going to, uh, get upset with with somebody he doesn't know in the house uh so i i knew he would either get get really upset with me as as an adult but still talk to me like you know i'm a child or he'd roll with it and so he rolled with it um but do you remember when we walked in and your dad was like come on let's go i'll show you where russell yes, city is yes. and i thought wait a second we haven't even sat down yet and he said you want to interview me and I <laughs> Yeah, and he's like, let's just go. I'll, I'll just okay. show you. I think he was under the impression we just wanted to see yeah. where Russell City used to be. Yes. No, he I didn't tell him anything because I knew he would, if I told him ahead of time, he'd have a chance to try and alter the details. So it, you know, I, I had to get him to a place where it, it wasn't about him controlling the the details of the situation. So it was, yeah, no, I will, I will not forget that because I thought he's gonna kill me. He's gonna kill me because he does not want, uh, me, he does not want to talk to us. You know, we as adults have not ever sat down with him and, and talked to him about Russell City. You know, we, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, I often feel like a, a little girl, even at the Russell City reunion picnics. Um, you know, our style has always been to listen. You know, listen to conversations about Russell City. So. 
it definitely felt like um <laughs> it felt like we were kids but not uh but not kids and not and, and not and certainly not reporters because he doesn't know us in that in our you know in a professional sense um but that's that's for me that was what was so special about it is that you know it was just like you and I are trying to do right now <laughs> It's a conversation. It was a conversation. We were just witnessing a conversation within a family. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mm -hmm. feel like I'm coming in as a journalist or as a filmmaker asking the questions. I mean, I would add whatever I, you know, whatever I felt I needed to add, but it was really your thing. It was really you and Ayana's, you know, conversation with your dad. Yeah. And I think, you know, I remember it lasted a lot longer than I thought, you know, initially he was he was reserved and, you know, and, and then it ended up lasting a lot longer than I anticipated. And at the end, I remember your dad saying, this is as far as I can take you. You know, I was only 10 years old when all of this went down. I couldn't really understand exactly what was happening because I was so young. Mm -hmm. But there is someone who is sort of like the keeper of the memories of Russell City. And yeah. he picks up the phone. I remember we were still rolling. We were still filming. It picks yeah. up the phone and he calls Sam Nava. Yeah. And he gets on the phone with Sam and he says, you know, there are these filmmakers, you know, they're here. Uh, you know, my daughters are here and they interviewed me, but I just told them this is as far as I can take them and they need to talk to you because you're older. And at that point, Sam was, you know, I think your dad was, 70 maybe perhaps two yes, yes. years ago yes. and so Sam is 10 years old so it was, Sam was 80 or 81 yeah so and then your dad puts me on the phone with Sam <laughs> on the spot yes. so I had to put the camera down <laughs> have the phone yes and we're, you know and I'm I'm saying yeah you, if it's okay if I can call you and you know so I remember this was we interviewed your dad on a Saturday Monday morning you know, Sam is still working to this day. He's 82, 83, and he's mm -hmm. still working every single day, seven days a week, long, long hours. And I remember calling him early in the morning before his day got started and being on the phone with him for a long time. And I remember him saying, have you ever heard of a man by the name of Pancho Villa? Mm -hmm. And I said, of course, I've heard of Pancho Villa. When I was a kid in Bulgaria, we studied him in school. So he's he's known around the world. He's like the Malcolm X of Mexico. You know, yeah. like he, everybody yeah. knows him as a revolutionary. Everybody knows him fighting for poor people and land reform. I mean, everybody, meaning throughout the world, it was part of, you know, it's just if you're going to have world education, you're going to know about Pancho Villa. Yes. And so then and I'm thinking, I, I wonder why he's bringing up Pancho Villa. And then Sam goes, you know, that's my grandfather. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking this can't be, can't. you know, until I went to his house and I see all these images because you've been to his house many yes. times. Yes. Yes. And you see all these images of Pancho Villa and he's got, you know, he's got the, you know, he's, he's, he's got his stuff, you know, he's got, he's armed and he's like riding on a horse. And I mean, it's, it's, it was just incredible. So I thought, Aisha, I thought that this would be a short film, you know, cause we were doing Still I Rise. We were doing a series of short films. Mm -hmm. We were about to start the fellowship program for women filmmakers. So I thought, okay, we can do a short film and it could be, around your dad's story and then Sam now. So it would be about this friendship between these two men who are 10 years apart, more yeah. or less. Yeah. And then it it grew. And I can tell you, it grew. You know, it, it, it was this one person would introduce us to another person. Like Sam would introduce us. I remember going to the shoreline and meeting um, Tony Wynn and meeting uh, Priscilla Figueroa and meeting all of these different people. Um, and then, you know, and then through, through, it was just this, like, this reaction, right? Like a domino effect, you know, mm -hmm. one person is connected to another person. Mm -hmm. I, oh, and that's, that's the shoreline is where I met um, council member Angela Andrews. Yeah. I remember reaching out to her and she was so generous. I mean, she sent she sends this. It's so rare, you guys, in filmmaking for someone to send you four pages, a huge list of here are the people you need to talk to. And she was the one who said, you know, you need to connect to Ronnie Stewart. He's the one who's running West Coast Blues in the festival. And he knows a lot about the music scene in Russell City. Uh, you need to talk to Artavia Berry. 
Mm-hmm. You need to talk to, there was a whole list, I remember, and you know, quite a few of the people, you know, Sam was on the list, um, but there were a lot of residents. And then, you know, Diane Curry, you know, who I had reached at the Hayward uh, Area Historical Society. And so I connected with Diane Curry for, to, to see what kinds of images, archival information there was to make. And this is, again, still, we're still thinking short, short film. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're still thinking that the focus would be Sam and your dad, James Knowles. And so, you know, I reach out to Diane, we make an appointment. You know, I know she's swamped with all of these media requests because at this point, this this the apology had already happened. Mm-hmm. This is after November of 2021. And so she's had, she's getting all kinds of media requests and she was so sweet. She made time for, for me to come over and she had all of these photographs from Russell City laid out. And I remember the idea was that I would take pictures of the pictures with my camera. So it's, you know, high resolution. And I remember asking her, you know, do you have more light? And she's just rolling around this cart with all of these photos and finding the perfect space. And then, you know, these images, you know, the photographs cost. And I remember telling her, you know, this is, you know, we're, we're independent. We are, this is not for profit. It's for the greater good. And I remember getting this bill from her and I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this with everyone, but I remember getting this bill and it was so reduced the amount was it was like a symbolic fee for all these images that we could use in the film and I thought I'll never forget this gesture I'll never forget this kindness and then also Diane Curry at one point I can't remember which month it was but she um, you know months and months had passed since I had visited the Hayward Area Historical Society and she asked me you know are you interested in meeting and interviewing the last resident, the last house, standing house in Russell City, you know, um, the grandmother had refused to move. And so when the officials came, they kept coming and giving her these deadlines of you need to vacate the premises. And, you know, I think they had given, I can't remember the amount, but it was not much money that they, they were giving them and she, she would not move. And so at the, at one, at one point they said, we're going to bulldoze you with your house if you don't get out of here. And so this was um, the person who Diane Curry had met was Leonard Ancona, and he had donated through his mom and his aunts. He had donated all of these, you know, this mailbox and a washboard and a wheelbarrow. Um, he had donated all these items that they had kept. It was the only house that really had stuff to, had kept stuff to donate. Um, and then his mom set the house on fire and watched it burn because she didn't want to see it bulldozed because that's where his mom grew up. Mm -hmm. She was raised by his grandmother. So I remember doing that interview. And so gradually through time, you know, Artavia Berry was also wonderful. She said something um, to us, which was, I asked her, what kind of film would you like to see? And, And Artavia Berry is the chair of the Hayward Community Services Commission. Is it a commission? Uh, I believe so. Yes. 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 So um, she was the chair and she worked with a group of people to draft an amazing group of individuals to draft um, the apology resolution. So I remember talking with Artavia and asking her, what type of film do you think we should be making? And she said, you know, this film needs to be about the people. It needs to be about the residents. Yes. And that really, you know, had a huge, and she was, she was incredible. She said, you know, here are a few more people you need to talk to. So it was through Artavia Berry mm-hmm. that we met um, Gloria Moore. Yes. It's Gloria Moore. I hope she's, she's, yes. joined, she's joined us and who's also a producer. Yeah. Uh, and this film would not exist without Gloria Moore. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll explain why. And then also uh, Marion Johnson was the other person that Artavia put us in touch with. So I'm just trying to paint this picture where you can see how different people were connected to yeah. different stories and those doors were opening. And the more doors that opened, the more, obviously, the more material we were able to gather. Mm-hmm. Um, and But it was not, for me, it was still not a feature length documentary until Gloria Moore. Mm-hmm. Gloria had found, going through her garage, she had termites in her garage, she was clearing her garage, and there was a a box on one of the shelves. And so the the box falls, I mean, it sounds like something that you see in a 
you know, in a, in a fiction film, right? Like the box falls or like you're reading in a fiction book. And, you know, this, this manuscript comes out, this transcript comes out of this box and it's this thick, it's over 200 pages. Um, and it's the transcript from 1963 of the hearings during which there were three hearings. The first took place in Oakland and the last two took place at the Veterans Memorial Building in Hayward. And people, the residents of Russell City, and unfortunately, they're all gone. They're no longer with us, except for one person who's in the documentary. Um, the residents of Russell City and the officials uh, during that time the, the board of supervisors, the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, who acted as the redevelopment agency. You see in the transcript how people really fought to keep their land. Mm -hmm. You see it, and, and you know, transcripts don't lie. It's yeah. just, it's there, word by, you know, by word. Yeah. And you read it, and I remember when she shared that transcript with me, and then she had shared it with the city of Hayward and families, you know, she was just wonderful to, to give everybody access to this document that none of us had none of us had this mm -hmm. and I remember reading through these 209 pages and thinking that's the feature film mm -hmm. this is this is a feature film now mm -hmm. because that was the biggest missing piece because we have the testimonies we have the families we have the family accounts the people who are still with us most of them in their early 80s now but and you know some in in the early 90s but the missing piece was the people who had who who had passed on who who couldn't tell that story but yet they're telling that story because of those words in the transcript right yes mm -hmm. um, so our challenge was well how do we take 209 pages and condense it so i worked with a friend of mine an incredible editor lydia chavez who she and I, you know, just went through the transcript and then we narrowed it down to 10 pages. And now out of those 10 pages, how do we bring this to life? So um, we hired a lot of voice actors. And you see them, if you go to the webpage, you see this huge list of names. And the thing, and again, credit to Angela Andrews, because I reached out to her and I said, Angela, do you know anyone in Hayward who does voice work or... And she put me in touch with the place in San Francisco. So I reached out to those folks and, you know, and they, they were, they were great. They just, we had this extended trailer of the film to give them an idea of what the content of the film would be. And they just posted it widely to all these professional voice actors. These people love the film so much or the premise of the film, the idea of the film so much that I remember again saying, like, we don't have much money. It's, you know, we can't pay, you know, and I remember people just coming and saying, We'll do it for free. We just want to be a part of this. This is so important. This is such a historic documentation of something that should never be forgotten that, you know, we'll do it free of charge. And they were incredibly generous. And all of them are coming to our community screening, all of the voice actors. Wonderful. And then I remember also feeling like, you know, we need to not only have professional voice actors, but people, people, the people around us, people who know about the story which brings me to our mutual friend, Vince Martin. Yes, you know? yes, yes. Remember, you know, and you recognize his voice when you watch the rough cut. Yes, You're I like, do. I know this voice. Yes. It's That's such a it. distinct voice. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I can talk for hours. I'm mm -hmm. going to pass the ball to you. No, I, no, I, I, I mean, but this is, I mean, when, when we talk about the, I mean, at least for me, the connections to the fire service, which I, I never imagined I would have, you know, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the threads or in the creation of this uh, film, um, you know, when when we go back to the making of In the Red, um, the the previous doc documentary that you um, created, you know, when I saw In the Red, you know, the the what I loved about it is you told the story of, you know, of, of young men becoming firefighters that everybody had counted out, you know, and, and you, and you did that in an authentic way that, that didn't take away from them as men and them as, 
as black men. And so, you know, to, to me, when you can tell a story and, and tell it as it's authentic, you know, tell it as an authentic story and, and not, um, undermine or, um, you know, not, not take away from the story. I mean, you just, you, you know it when you, I mean, for those who will be watching this later, you, you know it when you see it because of how you feel when you see it. Um, and, and that's what I have, you know, in my heart, you know, like that, I've always wanted that for, for Russell City. Like if th there's very, there, there's, there's one book about Russell City and that, that is the book that the Hayward Historical Society uh, wrote th that they uh, created in partnership with Dr. Maria Ochoa. You know, th there is not a lot of information about Russell City. You know, we are not talking about somewhere in the South. We're talking about somewhere in Alameda County. You know, we're talking about somewhere in Alameda County. Uh, and a lot of people don't know to this day, you know, even with the, the specials that have been on the news, people come up to me, people that I have known my entire life, and they uh, feel heartache around not knowing anything about Russell City um, because they didn't know. And so, you know, when I saw in the red, and then when I, you know, when I reached out to Wellington and just had been thinking a lot about, um, you know, who, who could tell the, you know, who could tell the story about Russell City and who could help um, amplify the, the, the stories of Russell City families. And, you know, and, and that's why I've always thought of you. Um, and I never, you know, never imagined any of this and I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, and so none of, you know, I, I just wanted to say that before we, we moved forward. You know, I always think, and, and thank you for saying that. I always think when making a film, I always think that you can't, you cannot feel another person's pain or hurt unless you fall in love with them. Mm -hmm. right? If somebody if you're sitting at a bus stop and somebody comes and sits next to you and starts pouring out their heart and tells you their story, you, you're not invested in this person. You're thinking, why is this stranger telling me all this personal stuff? Right, right, right. In a way, that's the challenge in filmmaking is you go into people's homes, you sit there with them. You know, I remember sitting with Zenobia and Andy and I mean, you know, all the amazing and Edie and Betty, may she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. And all these amazing people that we met and you're thinking, you know, they're giving me their story and my job as a filmmaker, our job as the creators of this, because, you know, I don't work alone. I work with an incredible team, small team, but an incredible team of people and our job through music, through art, through storytelling is to make you fall in love with them before we even present to you the pain and the hurt, you know, you need to fall in love with them because now as a listener and as a viewer, you're invested. Mm -hmm. Now I got you in your seat. Now you're going to stay. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to stay all the way through. And hopefully by the time you leave that auditorium, something in you would be changed. Because I always talk about the power of filmmaking. You know, once you know, we talked about this yesterday, once you know, you cannot unknow it. Once right. you know what happened in Russell City and what happened in over 600 cities in the United States and how systemic and how orchestrated it was, you cannot plead ignorance. If I know how the poultry industry, I just watched a documentary the other day about the poultry industry and who controls it and who controls the chickens and how they're putting all these farmers in the South out of business. Once you know it, you can never eat that chicken the same way that before you knew that. Mm -hmm. That's the power of storytelling and that's the power of documentary film mm -hmm. i think like if, if there is anything that i wish for the apology for our film it's that it awakens that that people say wow i didn't know i didn't know and and now i have all this information in front of me and now mm -hmm. i can put these pieces together as well yes why things happen yes. to why it happened to these people in particular yes. why it wasn't happening to everyone 
why was it happening? Like, what is urban renewal? How did that come about? But with Russell City, there's so many layers of complexity because with uh -huh. Russell City, it was an urban renewal. It was not funded by the federal government. They didn't want funding from the federal gov government. Because if you had funding from the federal government, you have to keep meticulous records of where people were relocated, where they were placed, and so on. And so um, one of the reasons I love uh, journalism so much is because it allows us to travel through time. And it's through all of the articles and all of the archival footage and research that we did that it starts painting this picture of what exactly happened. I mean, I'm, I'm reading these stories, Asia, in you know, in the Oakland Tribune. Um, what was the? It was the. Was it the Hayward Daily Review? Yes, was that Daily the Review. Yes. And so you know, there and there is this one man who who wrote a lot of stories, and I know you and I talked about this. <laughs> Uh, Herb uh, M M Mitchelson. Yes, he wrote a bunch of, yeah, he wrote, wrote a lot. Herb, Herb. Yeah, I mean, look at this. This is this is thanks to Sam Nava. You know how he has the board, the picture yes. boards. Yes, this was yes. one of these stories. And this, I have a very weak spot for Mr. Huey. Mr. Huey grew yes. roses. He's after his wife passed away. He continued taking care of her roses in Russell City. And there, this is an incredible story. And so Vince. Vince Martin is the voice of Mr. Huey when you're looking at the at the section in the film um, of the hearings. And we end with Mr. Huey, Huey's words. But you know, this this reporter, you know, he, you know, like you you read, you read these stories and you read statements like, I'm quoting, the people they are not articulate, but what they have to say is well said. And then you see the language that's used throughout. They're calling Russell City a disgrace, menace to health. The county surveyor calls the area a black mark against the county. Um, and then, you know, someone in another article, someone says what has been brewing for nearly a decade is finally bursting out of its kettle. You know, uh, this other reporter says in Russell City, it's all relative. What is squalor to one is utopia to another who knows nothing but squalor. So, and you know, you, through the, through this reporting, through these statistics, through all of this, you start putting all of it together. And then of course, through the transcript, I think the transcript was mm -hmm. central in the film, mm -hmm. very much so. Do you want me to keep talking? No. <laughs> Uh, oh, you know, the one thing that comes to mind when you were talking earlier about uh, people not knowing about Russell City, um, in, in this is from 1953, Russell City was the only, was the county's only residential area without storm. Did you know that? It was the only place in Alameda County that was without storm and sanitary sewer service and a running freshwater supply. It was the only place, you know, and then you look, we always talk in, um, in investigative journalism, all you have to do is just follow the money, mm -hmm. follow the money, and then you get the answer as to why things happened. Um, in Russell City, and this is, some of this is not in the film, you know, we couldn't include everything, but the assessed valuation of Russell City uh, was a mere $98,000. Uh, and then to install, again, these are from articles in the 50s. So you gotta, you really have to dig. You can't just start in 1963. Right. You gotta go back in time. You gotta go back into the 40s. You yeah. have to go back to the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, but installation of fresh water lines, storm and sanitary sewers, and paving of streets would cost five hundred and fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So um, you know, it was it was not. You know, people didn't feel the Alameda County didn't feel like it was worth investing that for the residents of Russell City. Mm -hmm. And then you think, well, who made the Russell City? Who were the residents of Russell City? Mm -hmm. uh, there was, you know, 45% Mexican, Latino, which at that time, you know, I, I was looking at this last night, that at what point on the census, because you remember when you shared that census report? Yeah. What year was that from? 1950. So in 1950, 
people couldn't choose Hispanic or Latino. It was not even an option. So a lot of people who came from Mexico or were Puerto Rican mm -hmm. who lived in Russell City were clicking the Caucasian box. Yeah. So, you know, this is another thing we have to keep, you know, fortunately we have distance and time to keep all of that in mind, but that's another thing that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at population statistics, that just because something says 45%, it was probably higher than 45%. So, yeah. but in the 50s, this is what was in the newspapers. 45% of the population in Russell City is Mexican, mm -hmm. and then 39% is Black American mm -hmm. coming from, and folks were migrating from the South. And, you know, and then um, there was a, the Bracero program, which was established in 1945 between the US government and Mexico to bring workers to do the agricultural work in California, and not just in California and in Oregon, sort of in the in the um, the Northwest, the Pacific West. Mm -hmm. So you know, you find out what, how people came to Russell City in the first place. Mm -hmm. We talk about this in the film, the warriors and people arriving because of all of this ship, you know, the shipyards in Vallejo and Richmond in Oakland and you know people they needed workers they needed able bodies to do those jobs they needed people in the fields they needed you know so and and but at the same time could people purchase homes wherever they wanted no they couldn't the right. Russell city was the place it was an unincorporated area that's where people went and settled so um i don't know if do you do you want to open this to questions aisha so we Let's can see. We, we can take a look at the questions. We definitely have a few of these. If you'd like, I can, I can read them to you or you can read them directly from your, your Q&A. Um, uh, while you're looking, one of the comments that we got from uh, Winda Shizmut is that, thank you for this amazing conversation. I greatly appreciate the steps that took to make these connections and build this film in the process of building a community. Congrats, because it looks like it takes an incredible amount of energy to connect these stories. Wow. Mm, thank you. Thank you. The first question that we did get kind of early on is um, Sheila was wondering if we could get a brief overview of what and where Russell City is and was located in Hayward um, and what happened there to lead Hayward to issue the apology. Aisha, do you want to talk about the geography of Russell City? Uh, sure. So Russell City is located uh, physically, well, if you're in the city of Hayward, Russell City was an unincorporated community. If you're off of off of West Winton, um, so near the airport, I'd say uh, between the airport, I think the how common it's commonly described now is between the airport and uh, Chabot College. But if you're familiar with where the household hazardous waste uh, location is in Hayward, um, where that is located uh, toward the shoreline, um, that is where, where the industrial park is off of West Winton, that is, uh, roughly an area of approximately 200 acres where Russell City was located. I'm not sure if that helps answer your question, uh, but that is that is the area that, I mean, and there's also, so for those who live, are familiar with the Russell, the dumps that were located in the area or who may have traveled to the dumps that were located over close to the Hayward shoreline that, that you, you would have traveled uh, through Russell City. I, you know, and for people who are not um, based in the Bay Area, I usually say that it's, uh, you know, 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes from Oakland and an hour okay. from San Francisco. And that was also the appeal in 1915. There was a wonderful ad where they were trying to get people to invest and purchase uh, yeah. in homes in Russell City. And that was one of the the you know the the pitching points is that it's just an hour from San Francisco, it's less than half an hour from Oakland, and you know it's by the water, so it was um, you know prime real estate, still is. Yes. 
the next question uh, is, is Hayward considering taking a step beyond just issuing an apology? So uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about um, why Hayward was issuing an apology, what they were apologizing for, and if there were any steps that we understand that they're going to be taking beyond the formal apology. So Hayward did, um, I, I am not a spokesperson for the city of Hayward. Let me just uh, clear, uh, qualify that statement. Uh, and, and you can read about the city of Hayward's uh, the actions or the recommendations that were made by the the mayor and city council uh and the that were there were there were recommendations made by the the city of hayward human services commission that were unanimously approved by the uh mayor and city council uh one of those recommendations were to create a steering committee of former residents and descendants of Russell City. And then there were a number of other steps that were identified. Um, I can't remember, I think it was over 20 steps that were identified. And those are listed on the City of Hayward website. Uh, I am a member of the steering committee. I currently serve as the chair. And so we actually have um, monthly public meetings that are listed on the Hayward, the city of Hayward website. They are on the fourth Wednesday of every month. And you're invited to, to join us for those virtual meetings. Uh, and the, the information can, can also be found on the city of Hayward website if you'd like to, to log on. Now we have a question from Ava Poon and her question is, was redlining a part of the reason the residents of Russell City ended up living in that unincorporated area? Yes, very much so. It was redlining, it was racial steering, and it was um, uh, the restrictive covenants, which uh, Gloria Moore talks about in the film in a beautiful, beautiful way. I, you know, the traditional documentaries, they always want you to include or they, who is they? In a traditional documentary, it's usually expected by the audience and sort of like by the uh, the greater community of filmmakers and producers and uh, viewers that if you're going to do anything that's historical, you're going to include uh, experts, historians, and academics. And, you know, we reached out to five or six different people um, throughout the country, not just in the Bay Area. There was a wonderful uh, person, at Johns Hopkins, who does a lot about the connection between geography, race, and urban redevelopment. And, um, and then at a certain point, as we continued making the film, um, I decided that I actually wanted people in the community to explain all of this. And so I made an extra trip. Gloria Moore lives in Los Angeles. And I remember reaching out to her and also talking to Aisha about it and saying, you know, there is a missing piece in the film where we really need to explain why people were living in Russell City and why people were purchasing homes in Russell City. And, you know, could you tell me what had happened to your family? Um, because both of her parents were, gainfully employed, they could have bought a house in San Leandro, they could have bought a house in Oakland, they could have bought a house in, in Hayward, but they couldn't. They couldn't. So it was really important for someone to explain how during that time, how difficult, how it's not even difficult, how impossible it was for a person, whether this person was Black or Latino, to live wherever they wanted to live. So um, yeah, that, that's the answer to your question. Then I see a question here. Were you able to connect with Harold Davis? Uh, yes, Susan, I was able to connect with Harold Davis. And you know, you guys, uh, this is a question from, well, it's from Susan, but I, I met with uh, the Hayward Concerned Citizens. Aisha, Gloria, and I met with the Hayward Concerned Citizens. I think it was last September when we met. And they had this incredible information that one of the people who was actually in charge of um, the relocation and the redevelopment agency was still alive 
And um, so when you come, I know that you've RSVP to come to the screening. And when you come to the screening, you're going to see at the end under special thanks. I'm thanking you guys because without you, we would not have been able to find uh, Mr. Harold Davis. So I really appreciate you giving us that information. All right. Um, we've had a few people who have asked us uh, when, how they can access the film. Um, and so we, we've let them know about the public screen, screening that will be going on on May 6th. Uh, we do ask that you RSVP if you do intend on showing up just to make sure that we have enough seats for you. Um, but we have a question from Sheila. She's wondering if there will be other opportunities to see the film after May 6th. And I, I've also had a couple of other questions to access to the film as well. So. Aisha? Mimi and I were discussing this yesterday. <laughs> yes, there will be. We are, are discussing the what that looks like currently. We were we want to get through the first date. <laughs> um, but yes, there there will be. Uh, there, there are a couple of groups that have reached out uh, and would like to to discuss partnering on on hosting a, a screening so we're going to get through the first date on May 6th and then and then we'll um we'll get back to everyone on what the additional dates will be yeah and just uh just so you know we are actually releasing the film uh next year in 2024 so in the meantime we will have a series of community screenings that are private and the reason I say private is because we will be submitting the film, the finished film. We're still working on it. Believe it or not, we are still working on it. And we will um, we will submit the documentary to a lot of film festivals throughout the nation. Um, and also not just in the United States, but throughout North America and Central America. And so our plan is to get this film widely seen, but um, our priority will always be to honor the residents and descendants of Russell City, because this film is for you, it's about you, and it's it, it, could, it, could, it could never happen without you. And so, you know, I, we wanted you to see it first, which is why we scheduled the community screening. And the community screening on May 6th um, is in the same space, again, much thanks to Alfredo Rodriguez, who is uh, running and maintaining and managing um, the, the Hayward Veterans Memorial Building. And we really wanted it to be in the same space where the hearings took place six years ago. Because again, there's a lot of people who are no longer with us. And, you know, but to be in that same space, because the space is unchanged. It was built in the 30s. It's this beautiful building. And the floor is the same. The, the, the you know, the the lights, the beautiful chandeliers and, you know, light fixtures are the same. All the details are there. And we're going to project it on the same old screen that has this beautiful stencil. I mean, it's just, it's so, it's got so much character um, of when people were watching films back in the 30s that a projection room there. And so it's going to be a really great space to, for us to, to do our first community screening. And then after this first one, and it's going to be a full house. So please, 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 RSVP. Um, be, be, just please, it's, you know, we have to know how many chairs to set up and and they would really help us. And you can't just show up because you, you will not get a seat. We have a lot of people coming. So um, after this first screening that we do, we'll have a lot more because I know there is a lot of interest and we want to also get the film to schools and colleges and, and local libraries. We want people to learn about what happened. And it's a, a great, you know, people always talk about you know, when I've had previous films and documentaries shown, there is always someone in the audience who says, thank you so much for giving voice to the voiceless. And I would always say that I'm not giving voice to the voiceless. You know, people have a voice, people have been talking about this, people have been sharing stories, people have been complaining, and people have been fighting for many, many, many years. They just don't have the platform. That's it. That's all that I am providing is a platform for those voices to be. Like if you if I if someone were to do an illustration of me, it would just be a little head with the 
what's that called, Aisha? A megaphone? A loud <laughs> mega. You know what I'm talking about? The megaphone? Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's that's the only illustration I want. It's just a little head with a megaphone. That's it. That's all I'm doing. It's just providing the platform and making sure that um, people get to 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 learn and also not to forget. And again, you know, back to that original point. Once you know, you cannot unknow it. You can never say, I didn't know, because now you do. I think we have more questions. Oh, Maria, thank you for, for your beautiful comment. I'm, I'm reading it now mm -hmm. about your family in Russell City. And I hope you can come to the screening because even though your uncle is not here anymore, you, you know, you'll get to see through the images and through the footage and through the interviews. Hopefully, it'll transport you back in time where you can experience some of, some of it. And I think the point that Maria makes about, um, you know, hearing stories about Russell City being a welcoming place uh, with, you know, with locations that are uncle frequented was, you know, also part of what we wanted to make sure was shared about Russell City is, you know, for, for me growing up, um, you know, there's a narrative about Russell City that continues to circulate about being a blighted, you know, blighted community about a slum, a, a dump. Um, and those are not stories that were ever centered in the, in the, the time that I shared with family. Um, you know, Russell City was about love and family and feeling supported. And, you know, growing up, uh, one of the umpires that I, that I had <laughs> growing up at softball games was from Russell City. Uh, you know, I had had a lot of cousins and aunts and uncles from Russell City, you know, everybody, there's always somebody from Russell City around. Um, and so, you know, part of this is helping to, to share the beauty of Russell City um, that, has, love. That, that hasn't been shared before. So thank you, Maria. And you know, sometimes um, I'm sorry to um, interrupt you. No, I understand. There was a lot of love. It was a lot mm -hmm. of love in Russell City. And I think sometimes it's so easy when you're reading these articles and because of all the labels, you know, it's considered, you know, it's even on our film poster, it's the shame of Alameda County. Right. Soon the shame of Alameda County will be wiped out or erased off of the map. And, you know, when you use this type of language, and it's interesting because in all of these articles that we've been reading, from that period, you know, they're stating all of these, they're making all these statements, but no one asks why. Like, why? Why did this happen? You're calling this Islam, you're calling this blighted, but why is it like this? No one answers that question. Right. And, you know, and I always think to, to this, if, if, if wherever you are living right now, if the garbage collectors stop collecting your garbage, if you no longer have running water, because, you know, we all have this amazing luxury here in this country of having you know hot and cold water and running water in most communities we have this amazing luxury to be able to turn on the lights right we have this amazing luxury to have in indoor plumbing and not, not be in outhouses at least you know within the more urban areas is what i'm talking about but if all of that is taken away or was never established in the first place how long before somebody comes to your neighborhood and calls it a slum I don't think it would take that long once garbage stops getting collected, if you don't have running water, if you don't have paved streets and every time it rains, it's just mud and you can't get your car out and your kids have to put on boots on top of their shoes just to get to school, it's not going to take long. And so, you know, I, I kind of like to challenge people to think about, um, you know, we have all these basic services that a lot of us don't even think about. And what happens when you take away those basic services and you say, those basic services are not gonna be for this population, for this number of people. And keep in mind that in the 50s, in the early 50s, there were 3000 people living in Russell City. You know, we keep hearing this number of 1400 people, but that was in, you know, in the early 60s that it was 1400 people. In the early 50s, in like 1952, 1953, there were 3,000 people living in Russell City without running water, without proper sewage, without plumbing, without paved streets, without proper electric, electric lines. And, and once that area become, became an industrial park, take a guess how long it took for all of that to get set up. 
I'm just, I'm not even going to answer that. I'm just going to leave it open ended. It did not take that long. It happened very quickly. Um, so we do have a couple of other questions here, um, but definitely some comments that just want to speak to uh, the passion that both you and and, and uh, Aisha are showing. So we have Wenda again, appreciate so much the passion of you both, Mimi and Aisha, for getting this film to completion and beyond. Um, Judy Lockhart thanks you for the information within the presentation and certainly looks forward to attending the screening. Um, Amber says, I appreciate the energy and passion that you both and the test team for art have for putting into this documentary. This is important and clearly a labor of love. I look forward to May 6th and doing what I can to uplift this project if so far beyond that. That's wonderful. Thank you. And one more uh, comment that was just made for your consideration as you are uh, thinking about uh, rescreening and, and how to continue to, to get this project uh, out to as many people. We have an attendee that just would like to suggest that it might be great to have an online viewing at some point for folks that are at risk for COVID. Well, yeah, we will, we will, you know, the film will definitely, the, the, there is a, a certain process and at times it's frustrating, but it's it's a certain process we have to follow with uh, the release of a documentary film for it to gain momentum and for it to, to do all the work it needs to do. And that process is, you know, it goes to film festivals and while it's doing the film, what we call the film festival circuit, we're not allowed to post the documentary online. Uh, once that is completed. So, you know, we this is why we're scheduling in person. True, they're in person, but we're scheduling, we will have as many community screenings for people to see. Um, but that said, eventually, once we are done with the film festival uh, route, we will have the film available online for everyone to see free of charge. Um, so it will be available. You just have to be a little bit patient with us, please. One of our last comments here is from Sheila, who wants to say thank you so much to the both of you for the opportunity to hear what went into making the documentary. It is so important that as many people as possible can see this film. Thank you for planning to make this film available to schools. Thank you. Um, and also, I wanted to I wanted to say I'm not sure if you were able to share this, but um, we have a, a, a the film's website is the Apology Film. Dot com so you can see the trailer there you can read the description of what the film is about um, you can see the people who participated in the making of this film you can see the people who were featured in the documentary film so and we will also use the website as this wonderful platform to continue adding uh, information and keep it you know we're not putting the private screening on May 6th because this was widely distributed among our own communities but um, in the future, we will be uh, adding any press coverage or any, um, you know, screenings throughout the, the nation. We will be adding those to the website. So it's a good website for you to, to check from time to time if you're interested in the film. And for those of you, we, we have included some of those links in the webinar chat that you are uh, welcome to take a look at. And for those are viewing after the fact, uh, you can check the, uh, the description at the bottom of our YouTube page and it will have those uh, links as well. Thank you for doing that. And again, I, I really appreciate all of you, you know, joining us and, and spending an hour with us um, today. And uh, I, know, I know your time is on the week especially on the Saturday on such a if it were raining I wouldn't be saying this is what else do you have to do but on such a nice sunny day you could be out there and you 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 chose to share it with your time with us so we appreciate you thanks everyone thank you have one more question here oh no it looks like that is the conclusion of the questions that we have, ladies. So um, again, with the Historical Society, we just wanna thank you so much for taking your time to come and share with us your process. Uh, we know how busy both of you are and, and we, we appreciate you giving us, uh, giving us your time to talk about this. We're very excited and um, you will definitely see us on May 6th, of course. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone else who will, will join in, in the party because we're very excited for this screening. So thank you both very, very much.
Um, we hope that you all enjoy the sunshine because we finally have some today and uh, take care. We hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.